Hello, I'm Andre J, and welcome to the first class of video synthesis processing on the Raspberry Pi 3B slash 3B plus. Um, so this is a course um, which is primarily about how do you make crazy video stuff like this. And at the end of this course, you will have the basic tools to take a camera feed like this and then turn it into a camera feed like that. Um, so yeah, motivating, uh, 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 motivation, I think has probably been established here pretty well. <laughs> Seems like this is, I mean, most people probably already knew they wanted that before they came into this class, but generally a, a, a nice rule of, uh, uh, speaking is to give someone some motivation immediately. So. Let me talk about, first, the outline of this class is that, first I'm going to talk a little bit of philosophy and approach, uh, 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 and this is actually going to be useful information for like how the class goes. If you find it really boring to talk about philosophy, skip about 10, 15 minutes in, and we'll start talking about like the, 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 the we'll start getting hands on here. But the first part, mainly going to be listening. Um, so philosophy and approach. Our primary interest here is to learn fundamentals of video synthesis. Uh, 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 and the tools that we're going to be using are C++ and GLSL. Uh, 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 this is not a course in C++ or GLSL. And I do, would actually recommend that folks, if you've never programmed in either of these languages before, I recommend that folks have some sort of experience programming something else, just because these are not the most user-friendly languages. And I'm going to be teaching you two, we're going to be working in two separate languages here. Uh, 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 and just basically any amount of like previous experience uh, is definitely going to be helpful. Um, if you want to learn from scratch, I would say start with my video synthesis and processing course. Try that one first and then you can work your way into this one. Uh, because the curriculum in both of those is actually totally the same. We'll cover the same topics and the same everything in both. Uh, the main difference is that uh, 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 processing is a language which is built to be built to be very user friendly it's built purely to be educational and it's a uh, success and popularity as a um what do you call it a uh, 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 artist tool sort of only became secondary to that or it was it was a secondary intention it just was kind of an accident processing was developed to teach kids and teenagers how to like program the idea is you program graphic things you get immediate uh, in and out if you program some sort of like a spreadsheet interface data management it's really boring like a five-year-old isn't going to be very interested in that a five-year-old is going to be very interested if they can press a bunch of keys and then make like squares show up all over the place and animate and stuff but yeah, so I'm only going to teach you the bare minimum of C++ and GLSL stuffs that you'll need in order to do this class, but this is a class in video, video synthesis. So the main principles are going to be something that you can basically abstractly use in any sort of a domain. But the way to think about it is, so if I was teaching a class in how to build a bed frame out of wood, uh, I wouldn't call it a saws class. I would make sure that I teach you the bare minimum of like safety and how to use like a variety of saws in order to like cut wood down and put it together into making a bed. But it's not a saws class. The saws are the tools you're using. So I want you to think about code as just a tool. Code is just another sort of a tool. It's not, they're, 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 there's nothing uh, more complicated to than that. Uh, the other thing I want you to remember, too, is that nobody ever learns everything about any programming language ever. Uh, the way literally everybody learns stuff is by copying other people's code and then altering a little bit and seeing what happens. So that's sort of the paradigm I'll be going with here. I'll be providing you with tons of templates that, you, that you'll use to, to work on your own homework stuff. Uh, 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 so you don't have to like go through the trial and error thing of like figuring out these bare minimum stuffs of like what is going to compile and what is not. Uh, 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 but uh, 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 you are only going to learn code. You're only going to learn these things by doing it. Uh, 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 so hopefully I've just given you enough of decent examples that you can play with. And I'll sure be showing you in this class how to just sort of like take existing code and figure out, like try to reverse engineer how it works and how to sort of experiment with it. 
Um, yeah, so second. So there's a lot of courses in creative coding, and uh, 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 this is sort of a course in creative coding in a way. Uh, 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 because, uh, uh, so the typical approach for creative coding courses is they want you to learn conventional coding techniques. Uh, uh, modern uh, day, that would be either object-oriented programming, some sort of object-oriented programming thing, or, you know, just basically learning, like, how to do Python to, like, do, like, very basic, like, mathematical tasks for you. <clears throat> Um, and then the end goal is that, oh, you'll use standard programming techniques, you use this object-oriented uh, uh, standard issue programming techniques in order to make cre programs that then do creative things. Um, so I have a problem with how this works, mainly for, it it's only works well if you know exactly what you want to achieve. <coughs> like, it doesn't really lend itself to an experimental uh, uh, framework very well and uh it's much more useful if you want to if your goal is to learn coding and like get employed by like a bank or uh i don't know who who who, who, who hires coders anymore some sort of like like venture capital startup bullshit probably if you want to get hired by venture capital startups uh, 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 I'm not going to teach you that kind of stuff here. So I'm going to teach you a creative approach to learning code. Uh, and I'm basically going to be teaching you how to teach yourself how to code. Because I don't really believe that anyone is actually able to teach anybody else anything. What a good teacher does, in my experience, is they just facilitate the... Uh, they make sure to facilitate a situation in which people can teach themselves very well. So that sort of... Uh, 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 yeah, that's sort of my philosophy on teaching coding is that I can't actually teach you how to code. All I can do is make it easier or possibly harder for you to teach yourself how to code. Um, choo -choo 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 -choo. So yeah, I remember one time I posted on like some video art board somewhere that I was, you know, offering courses in creative coding. Uh, and then some like, there's someone who was like a teenage, I thought they were like some sort of like teenage troll from the way they were talking. They were like, coding's not creative. There's no such thing as creative coding. Like coding is mechanical. Coding is just like, uh, 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 it's like a tool. You know, no, and the people who write code are just tools as well. So their thought process was just basically an artist should never have to learn how to use a tool. Uh, 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 like if an artist was was doing woodworking, there they were basically saying an artist should not un understand how to use a, any kind of saws. An artist should hire someone who knows how to use a saw because using a saw is inherently not creative. Knowing how to use tools is inherently not creative, and coding is not inherently creative, nor can it be creative. And I was just like, wow, there, that sounds like the most antithetical uh, nonsense to my philosophy possible. So I realized that this is sort of a thought process that people have. So I just wanted to make sure to address that and say, actually, creative coding for me and how I approach it, creative coding is not about uh, uh, just making a program using tools to make something that does something creative for you. Uh, creative coding is a process in which you use code as an experimental art form. You use code creatively. Uh, 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 and the way that you use code creatively, the way you use code f code as experimenting is uh, uh, it's actually going to be hindered by the whole process of like people making, if you try to make a bunch of giant classes, if you try to turn into a gigantic object oriented thing, uh, 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 you're actually getting in the way of like any sort of creative or experimental things happening. You know, the whole, the, 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 all of the techniques that make it much easier for you to program uh, like on some sort of like large website for a bank or something. Uh, 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 these are tools of standardization. These are tools that like just make it easy for like 20 people to all be working on the same project without it being a hellish nightmare to pull everything together at the end. Uh, these same things make it actually very hard for you to do anything interesting or creative within the code because everything is so stultified and like uh, uh, modularized and like turned into like these these very specific like black boxes that you aren't able to sort of like find interesting uh, relationships and uh, 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 you know you aren't able to set things up for like any sort of like creative experimentation within the thing. <clears throat> 
So that's why I'm actually going to be encouraging you not to write functions, not to write, uh, mostly not to write functions, not to write uh, 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 classes, not to do the sort of standard stuff. If you want to learn that sort of stuff, that's great. It's very useful stuff to know. You should check out Daniel Schiffman's uh, 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 YouTube channel. It's amazing, and they will teach you everything you need to know about writing, about making classes, making objects, and doing things in a standard uh, 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 writing code in a standardized way that can possibly get you hired somewhere. I want to teach you how to use code chaotically. <laughs> And that's mostly what like the homework stuff is going to be about. <clears throat> but yeah, going back to that person who was like uh, 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 telling me that coding wasn't creative. It turns out they were actually like some famous video artist from the 70s. They were old. They were just really like, I don't know, didn't quite get how the how, I'm, I'm guessing they didn't maybe didn't quite get how they come off on the Internet or they were just kind of a dick or something. But um yeah, I mean, the, 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 my argument is just plain and simple. Uh, if you want to create interesting and new artworks, uh, you have to invest some level of creative energy into both the concepts driving the artwork as, in, as well as into the technical executions of the artwork. And from my perspective, in my opinion, the most affecting artworks are those in which there is a conversation that occurs between concept and execution, meaning that the medium that you have chosen in order to execute your artwork says as much about, uh, 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 communicates as much as whatever your sort of like vision of what the artwork is. You know, this is also sort of contrary to this sort of modern like uh, 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 academic art critical theory thing where you're supposed to like, before you make anything, you're supposed to write down like what you're going to do and uh, everything you're going to do, which is seems very like bureaucratic and like uh, counterproductive to me. <clears throat> uh, 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 because it doesn't really allow you to do anything like most of the interesting things I've done and found in code have been sort of accidental. And they've been sort of these weird bugs that I then sort of like, you know, whatever I had been intending to do with the code, uh, I found some bug, did something wrong, made a mistake, and then I was just like, actually, this is a thousand times more interesting than what I was trying to do in the first place. <laughs> so that's creative coding. Uh, and I think that's also just like interesting artwork in general. All right. So the other main thing that I want to talk about before getting started here is about sort of the structure of the class and homeworks. So <clears throat> I have a very basic philosophy on teaching and learning, which is that people cannot actually learn anything from another person. Or to be more specific, people cannot learn how to do something. They cannot learn how to like actually do something for themselves from someone else. What someone else can learn from me they can learn facts, they can learn names, they can learn ideas, but they can't learn actions. Uh, a, a way to think about this is, so there's a, a class I teach in person here at Phase Space that I've been doing for a couple of years, and it's Introduction to Analog Signals and Systems. And the way I teach this class is I just set up gear and I give people the bare minimum of knowledge they need to know in order to operate the gear, and then I say, you do it. You touch things, and then you play around with stuff, and then every 30 minutes or so, we all get together and you ask questions about what actually are you doing here. And I can give you names of things, I can give you facts, I can give you things that you can research more on your own. But the fact is, is that I could not, there's no physical way I can teach someone how to use a camera without other than just saying, here's the camera, touch it and use it. Uh, 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 so this class is going to be taught in a very similar way. Uh, 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 where in each of the classes, I'm going to be providing you with just the bare minimum of names and a framework in which to like, uh, 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 like the bare minimum of ideas that you'll need in order to do the homework. <clears throat> but you are only going to learn things if you do the homework. Uh, and to be more specific, you're only going to learn things if you attempt to do the homework because the homework for these classes is incredibly difficult. Uh, they will start out with um, some very simple things uh, that will be pretty much telegraphed by stuff I do in class, and then they will quickly build up to things which will probably seem completely insurmountable to folks at first. The whole point of this homework thing is that you need to try the homework for each class before going on to the next one. If you don't try the homework, 
and like fail a little bit at at least some of it, you're not going to be well prepared for the next class. Uh, I also I, I want to make sure people are okay with the idea that they're not going to get everything the first time, that they're going to fail at some things, and things are going to seem really hard. Because this is how you actually I don't want to I'm not trying to set up toy problems here. You know, like the simplest things when you first learn like calculus or trigonometry or something or the mathematics things where they always give you these little toy problems and you work them out on paper and everything comes out perfectly with these even even numbers and integers. And you're like, wow, I'm so good at algebra now. Like I can complete the square in a second because, you know, the square, you know, it's a square that has uh, two uh, sides of length two or something. Uh, 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 but, you know, in the real world, when you're actually trying to do shit, when you're trying to make shit happen, you'd find that there's basically all these toy problems that all they did was give you this sort of, like, false sense of, like, security. <laughs> so I, I, I want to make sure that people know that, like, actually l teaching yourself how to do things, actually learning how to do anything worthwhile is fucking hard. And you need to spend time and you need to spend energy and you need to make sure you are able to deal with the fact that you are going to fail sometimes. You're not going to be able to figure things out. You're going to bash your heads against a problem, and then you're going to think about it for a while, and you'll go to sleep, and maybe the next day, five days later, two weeks later, four months later, you'll be like, oh, shit, now I understand this perfectly. Uh, 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 but you have to try. You have to try and fail a bunch of times in order to get better at things. So that's a big part of this homework, too, is teaching you how to not get discouraged by the fact that you're going to fail sometimes or fail a lot of the times. <clears throat> the other thing about the homework is, is that it's going to seem really, really, really fucking hard if you don't look things up on the Internet and try to find example code. That's the other thing I want you all to learn is that if you're trying to solve a problem in coding, you are not the first person who tried to solve this problem. Like 99% of the time, someone else has figured out a way to do this already. And what I want you to do is make sure to look up on the internet and see if someone else has solved this problem or a very similar problem first. See if you can find some examples, excuse me, on Stack Exchange or on like uh, uh, for a lot of this stuff book of shaders or the open frameworks message boards these are places you can find a lot of help for this sort of uh, uh, questions we'll be asking in the homework here uh, 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 and uh, 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 your goal for doing the homework is not just to copy and paste these answers uh, but to be able to copy and paste other people's code reverse engineer what's going on there and then try to make it fit into what we're actually doing here because that's how people actually write code in real life 99 percent of the time you don't write everything from scratch you find something else that already kind of solves a similar problem to what you're trying to do and then you figure out how you can like reverse engineer a version that works for your purposes <clears throat> so yeah homework it's going to be hard and if you can do at least a quarter of it, if you are able to successfully do at least a quarter of the homework before going on to the next class, you are in good shape. The homework, are, these, are, these are problems you should be chewing on for months at a time. <clears throat> so I'm trying to give you a full meal here, <laughs> a full meal of education. All right, <clears throat> and then the final bit of information I'm gonna be telling you is just what we're gonna cover in each class. So, this is the first chunk. I'm just about done just blathering at you. Uh, 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 after this, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to walk through the code structure. I'm going to give you probably the most information, the most concentrated information on C++ and GLSL that you will get during this entire course, just to make sure you have sort of a reference point, somewhere to go back and like play back uh, 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 if you ever get confused about a certain data type, a certain file, like why are things named dot cpp dot h what all these includes mean blah 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 uh, 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 and then i am going to talk about the uh, red green blue color space uh, uh, and hsv color space uh, uh, and then i'm going to sort of walk you through the homework that that you'll be working on which will be primarily using some sort of controls uh, 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 either a keyboard like keyboard like this or some sort of a MIDI controller in order to affect things and also how to print out numerical information to the screen and or to the console so you're able to debug things. And then I'm also going to make sure to 
show you what bugs look like in C++ and in uh, 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 the shaders so you understand how to debug some basic stuff. So that's basically what this class is going to be about. Second class will be about modulation and oscillators and exploring more about like how to work with geometry and time in uh, uh, this environment. <clears throat> The third class will be about using ping pong buffers to do video feedback, like we're seeing here. Uh, uh, and then we'll talk about how to work with color and geometry with inside of the, the doing feedback, which will mostly be, it'll be exactly the same in some ways and completely absurdly different in some other ways. Uh, and then in the fourth class, we will be bringing in external video, like I'm also doing right here. And we'll talk about how do we mix things together, how do we do keys, and how do we use module or how do we use these video oscillators that we talked about in the second course as a modulation source for doing video effects. So that's the class in a nutshell. So the first thing that you'll want to do, so I'm going to move things over to the Raspberry Pi here. So first thing you're going to want to do is if you have class project one on a USB drive is probably the easiest way to do it. And I'll show you how to move the, the class project over from a USB drive into the, the, the where you need it to be. So we're not going to see a pop up here. Let's see what we got. So if I open up this folder structure here, the place where I would see an external drive is media, pi, and not seen anything here, so something's going a little funky. Probably because I failed to eject it properly last time. Okay, I just needed to re-inject it. So if you plug in a USB drive, what you should see is removable medium is inserted, and let's open this up in the file manager. So Media Pi Mantis, that's just, you see it popped up here, Media Pi. That's the name of my external drive. So what we want to do is, here, let's just start over a little bit here. So we've got Mantis pulled up, and I'm going to be grabbing class project one. And then I go into Pi, and then I'm going to scroll down into Open Frameworks, and you go into Apps, My Apps. And I've already done it here, but what you'll do is drag this class project over and pull it into here. And then, you should see something like this inside of that class project. So once we're done with that, I'm going to try to make sure to eject this properly and make sure everything is still properly plugged into my Pi. Got two mice and two keyboard controllers here, so things get a little funky sometimes when I'm trying to like do stuff. <clears throat> so inside of this class project one, these are all of the files that go into what compiles into an open frameworks project using C++ and uh, GLSL. So I'm just gonna sort of walk you through each of these files and we won't open all of them up, but I just wanna tell you what they are. So the way this shit all compiles is by something called a make file and the add-ons.make, config.make, and the make file here are the three things that go into what actually makes your shit compile here. Uh, you really don't need to know very much about this at all in order to get anything done. Uh, 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 and if you want to learn more about it, uh, 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 I would invite you to do it on your own because it's kind of both boring and horrendous to try for me to try to teach. So, uh, uh, something I'm going to do in the meanwhile is sometimes compiling things on here can take a while. So I'm going to make sure to compile things for the first time in the background of this, and I'll and I'll show you what it should look like. Uh, for you to, 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 to make sure that it compiles right for you as well. So if I right click on this class project one and I select open in terminal and we get this terminal opened up here and I type make 
and and make run. And we'll let this compile in the background while I sort of talk about the other stuff going on here. So class project one, you can see this obj file or this obj folder showed up after I clicked make. In this obj folder, or obj folder, this is where uh, all the binaries basically get made. This is the, the, the code that actually compiles ends up in here. Uh, the stuff we're going to edit and work on is in bin and source. So src, we're going to see we have main.cpp, we have ofapp.cpp, and we have ofapp.h. So let me just walk you through everything here in order. So we're not going to look at main.cpp or ofapp.h very much at all in this class, but let me just show you what we've got going on here. So main.cpp is what sets up the windowing environment. Um, so we've got a couple of these includes. These are preprocessor directives. I'll talk more about those in a little bit. Um, everything that's behind these uh, asterisk slashes here, like this, for example, is a... a if this is a comment, so this doesn't get uh, compiled to code. Okay, so this is what you'd see if everything compiles well. If you want to close out of what the what that is doing, you press Control C while you have the um, terminal selected, uh, and then we go down to main here. Uh, so in here, what we're doing is we're, we 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 we've got this object GLES window settings. We're using OpenGLES, which is the embedded systems version of GL, uh, embedded systems because this is running on an ARM processor. Uh, this is also be the same sort of thing if you were writing for a cellular phone or a Chromebook or uh, any other sort of like more embedded system style processor as opposed to like a desktop or a laptop. Uh, uh, this is the sort of uh, OpenGL you'd be using. We're setting the size here, 720 by 480. This is the size of the output window that we saw. And then we create the window. So that's basically what goes on in main.cpp. Just basically creating the window. Uh, over here in ofapp.h, we've got some more of these preprocessor directives. Um, include ofmain.h, of include ofxmidi.h. So uh, in order to include add-ons, like in order to make sure we can use MIDI controllers like this, you need to use this sort of include uh, uh, preprocessor directive in the appropriate place. Again, not going to do any of this in this class, really. I just want to make sure you have the ability to understand what this means. Uh, pragma once. Uh, you mostly, you will, almost, you will not need to understand that at all for this class. Uh, if you're curious more about preprocessor directives, there's some pretty entertaining videos <laughs> that go into some pretty pathological detail about what's going on. The long and short is mostly what they're doing is doing text editing on the code before it compiles. So we have this class OF app. Here in the OFApp.h is where almost all of the uh, functions or procedures that we have <clears throat> are going to be declared. Like, for example, setup, update, draw, and exit. These are default ones that every sort of open framework project is going to need. Uh, we've got key pressed and key released. These are optional, and you can see they take in the argument of some sort of a key. So these are just uh, 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 procedures that will execute any time you press down a key on your keyboard. So we can use these uh, 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 key pressed and key released uh, 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 procedures in order to like use our ASCII keyboard as a controller. Uh, we've got some stuff that has to do with the MIDI controller. Not really going to cover this in this class. Uh, uh, more MIDI stuff. We're declaring a shader object, and that's called shader1. We're declaring two frame buffer objects. We will talk more about what these actually mean later on. Uh, for now, let's just think of shaders as where we do our GLSL pixel stuff. And we'll think of frame buffers as being these little like virtual screen workspaces where we make sure we do all of our pixel information inside of a frame buffer. So anytime we want to do something like draw to the screen or do some sort of feedback ping ponging on it, we are able to do that very quickly. Uh, OF Video Grabber, this is a way to grab some sort of external video in uh, 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 via uh, USB UVC Universal Video Controller, might be what that stands for. 
uh, uh, basically any sort of uh, uh, USB input uh, uh, which has which is class compliant, meaning you don't need to install any extra drivers or softwares to run it. You can use that as an input, and it will be uh, 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 represented by an OF video grabber object inside of these projects. Uh, these are just a couple of little janky procedures I wrote to allocate and declare things, input setup, input update, and that's OFApp.h. Technically speaking, for best practices, people say declare all your variables, declare all your objects, declare everything over here. Uh, I have basically never done that because it irritates the heck out of me to have to switch back and forth between multiple <laughs> uh, 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 files while I'm doing editing. So I mostly include most of the information uh, 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 that I need for my OF app dot stuff up in the, uh, uh, the top of the OF app setting. So we can see we've got this include OF app dot H right here. Uh, 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 so if you go back over and then OFApp.h had an include uh, 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 OF uh, or main.cpp or whatever. So what include means in this section is include means go find the, f the, 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 the file named OFApp.h, which is in the same directory here, and just copy all of that text over and put it right here. So if you think about it, what this include is doing is just copying and pasting text into this file. So it's, it's purely a matter of, uh, uh, it's not purely a matter, but it's mostly a matter of just like preference as to whether or not, as to where you actually want to put um, all of these definitions and whatnot. Uh, we're including this IO stream. Uh, uh, this is a old library basically from like C, which is just for doing in out uh, uh, you can type things into your keyboard and have it be recognized and turned into data, and you can spit things out into the console and see data that way. This is the console here. The terminal and the console, when I say those things, I mean the same thing here, this thing that pops up. That looks like an old-timey computery thing. Uh, define, this is another preprocessor directive. Define, and then you have a string, and then you have uh, uh, some kind of a data type here. Uh, uh, some people say this is horrible to do. Some people say it's the best ever. Uh, essentially, uh, 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 this is a way of de defining like constant uh, variables. A constant variable, right? <laughs> Meaning that anytime you see the words MIDI magic in this uh, uh, OFAP.CPP, uh, it'll just go through and make sure to replace every example of MIDI magic it finds with 63 0.50f. Uh, 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 I am clearly quite okay with doing this stuff, but uh, uh, most people should probably steer away from this until you've programmed in C++ for at least a year. And then once you've done that and you feel pretty okay with not blowing shit up, then get into using defines. Um, 63.50f uh, something you'll see a lot of in C++ is this 0f at the end of a number. Uh, what this means is if you just write 63.5, the, 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 um, the, the compiler will assume that you meant a double instead of a uh, floating point. Uh, and a double takes up twice as much storage space as a floating point number. Um, so basically, unless you need all of that resolution in your stuff, which sometimes you will. Um, uh, and you have a fuck ton of floating point numbers in your system, it's good to get in the habit of just making sure if you write down constants like this that uh, 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 you, 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 you make sure that they're floating point numbers. Uh, so yeah, that's what the zero F at the end of a number, uh, a constant means. <clears throat> Here we've just declared a couple of floats. These we will use for keyboard input. Uh, we're declaring these constants that we'll use to, to represent width and height of our output screen. Um, we, have, we can see this is another way to define a constant. You constant int control size. Uh, 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 we could have also used define to do that. Uh, uh, and we're using that as this. Uh, 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 so this is an int. You can see integers don't have a decimal point. Uh, 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 and this is a constant int because we want to use this as the, uh, 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 we're defining an array here, float control one. 
uh, uh, with uh, uh, size control size. Uh, if you tried to just put a regular int in there, you would get an error. Uh, so that's why you have to have a constant int uh, because you can't have your arrays change size all the time in C++. If you do want to have an array that changes size, look into a vector. Um, which I don't like to use vectors because I use so many real vectors in this stuff. We're mainly going to be talking about vectors when we are doing like the linear algebra kind of stuff in uh, GLSL that using the C++ uh, data type vector makes it so fucking confusing to teach people this stuff. Like it's really just an kind of an abysmal uh, 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 selection of the name of a data type. <laughs> But I guess only if you're doing linear algebra style stuff in your programming, which theoretically I think almost everyone is doing most of the time anyway, but pfft, whatever. <laughs> All right. And next we have the void OF app setup. Um, something I want to mention here, something that for some reason doesn't get taught in a lot of programming classes ever is why there's this void in front of things like OF app. Why is there this void in front of all of these procedures that were listed in the OF app.h file? The reason is that all, all procedures or functions or however they you want to call them in your paradigm, they need to return some sort of a value. Um, but it turns out, functionally speaking, like, like when you're actually making things happen in C++ and Java and shit like that, almost all of your functions don't return any sort of a value whatsoever, uh, meaning that the, 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 they're described as void. They return void, meaning void means null. It's not zero, it's not nothing, it means like uh, 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 the absence of any data type in a, a, a programming language. So that's what that's why it always says void OF app. That's why it says like void draw, void setup, void whatever and whatever sort of like thing you've learned. You know, almost all the time in your hello world things, it's like void draw, void out. I was like, why does it say void? <laughs> why what is the void? What is the meaning of the void? And that's the meaning of the void is that all of these functions are being called by some other sort of program. And the program needs to understand what this function is returning technically. So even though all of this stuff is doing other things as side effects, the value it returns to the program that calls it is void. And all of the other things it's doing are side effects, which if you've learned anything about functional programming, uh, uh, you might think are uh, uh, people who are into functional programming think side effects are evil. Uh, people who do a lot of C++ programming are basically... The, the, the thing about getting good at C++ is understanding that the side effects are kind of the point. <laughs> and that exploiting side effects, all the sort of like unintended or possibly intended like side like consequences of having all these funky side effects everywhere is why it's such a useful language. And also why it can totally break things in like pretty horrendous ways if you do stuff wrong. Okay, so that's what void means. Setup, everything within the setup is code that executes exactly once before your program actually starts properly. So we want to do things like setting vertical sync, uh, uh, theoretically make sure that your video output is synchronized with whatever sort of like refresh rate your monitor has. I very rarely noticed a difference on the Raspberry Pis between true and false here, but I keep it there just for the sake of superstition. Setting the frame rate at 30. Uh, uh, for those of us in NTSC worlds, uh, which is, I think, pretty much the United States and, uh, uh, well, North America and uh, Japan, uh, we do our video at, like, 30 frames per second mainly, especially the analog video. If you're using this uh, Raspberry Pi mainly to do analog out, you probably want to set your frame rate at 30 because it's the closest integer to 29.97. If you are in the rest of the world, you would probably want to set your frame rate at 25 so that it synchronizes with your system better. It's actually not going to do anything horrible if you leave it at 30 and you're in Germany and you want to do analog video out, uh, but you'll kind of do some small amount of optimizing by doing that. Oh, if background zero just default paints the, 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 the palette of our background as black. 
OF hide cursor. Make sure that the mouse thing doesn't show up in front of our uh, uh, output screen, which is definitely a good thing because we don't want to see a mouse cursor all the time. Width is defined as 640 and height as 480 because these are the, 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 the inputs that we'll be doing for our uh, uh, USB camera. Um, so, uh, you'll notice earlier in the main.cpp that our output window is 720 by 480, but we're defining width and height here as 640 by 480. Uh, this is because, so if you're doing, if you're doing this shit on a Raspberry Pi, 99% of the time, the reason you want to do this is because you're doing processing, which is optimized for analog video output. Uh, 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 the thing to note about analog video, if you want to plug this shit into a cathode ray television or a video mixer, is that uh, 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 neither NTSC nor PAL or CCAM or anything have a square pixel format. The, the, the aspect ratio of the pixels are uh, 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 a little bit... Um, I forget which one it is. I think they're wider than they are. Uh, uh, the X is larger than the, the, the Y. So they're sort of like uh, chunky um, and not just like blocky, like the typical sort of pixelization shit you would see. So in order to not completely fuck up our aspect ratios, if we're going to be doing, especially if we're doing analog IO here, is we need to make sure that we're doing our processing in 640 by 480. But at the end of the, 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 the situation, when we spit our video out into an analog video stream, that we stretch things out to 720 by 480 to make sure that our pixel aspect ratio matches up with the pixel aspect ratio of the CRTs or the video mixer that we're working with. Uh, that means for a lot of this stuff that we're doing here, we'll notice that it seems like it's stretching our video. And I'm leaving this as the default, uh, simply because doing things otherwise is going to really fuck you up once you get to like actually doing analog. And I'm making the blanket assumption that your main concern is doing analog stuff here. If it's not, otherwise, if you're primary, primarily interested in just doing this in like a digital only medium, then go back to main.cpp and make sure your output window is 640 by 480. And then everything will work out. Everything else will, will, will take care of itself in here. So input setup does the stuff that makes sure the USB camera is grabbing things right. Allocate and declare sundries is just making sure we have space uh, uh, declared in the memory for, for all of the stuff that we're going to be working on. Um, and then we do the MIDI setup. We load this shader. So in order to load a shader, we need to uh, 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 make sure we have this file uh, 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 thing pointing to data shaders ES2, and this is where our shader files are. So if we say shaders ES2, shader1, it will just automatically load shader1.frag and shader1.vert and uh, uh, compile those upon each time that it runs. <clears throat> Uh, we do this thing here. This is a little for loop just to make sure that our arrays are set to zero as a default. Something funky in C++, uh, which you may not be accustomed to if you've been doing Java or Python programming, is that if we do stuff like just declare um, an array here, this just sets aside space in the memory for the array. It doesn't zero everything out. If you did this in Java, it would make sure that control one zero, control one one, control one two, all of these array values would be set to zero. Same thing if we just declared int width and then we didn't say equal zero, all it would do is set aside some space in memory, make sure that it knows that that's where width points to, but it wouldn't do anything to the memory unless we specifically say, make sure to set that value to zero. So if you just declare variables in C++ and you don't zero them out, you're going to be dealing with the fact that it's going to just automatically point to whatever kind of garbage was sitting there in the first place. <laughs> so pretty fun. You can do some pretty interesting glitchy stuff with this. Um, but I want to make sure that everybody knows before you go any farther that when you declare variables, you have to make sure declaring any sort of a data type, you have to zero things out. Otherwise, it's just going to be filled up with random stuff. 
So in this input setup, we're setting our desired frame rate and our width and height. So we want this width and height to be the same thing as these. We want our frame rate to be 30, so it sort of matches up with uh, how we're drawing. Allocate and declare sundries. So we have to make sure that we allocate space and memory the, uh, for our frame buffer. And we want to make sure that we zero things out. And that's what this begin and end and the OF clear is. If we comment this out and run it, the frame buffer is just going to have a bunch of like garbage uh, 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 graphics data of just whatever was left in your graphics buffer from other things, which is pretty cool. If you're doing glitchy stuff, not super useful if you're trying to learn. Uh, so all of these things, these are things that execute only once. We don't need to declare, uh, uh, we don't need to set desired frame rate and initialize the grabber, video grabber every time we run. We don't need to allocate space for frame buffers every time we run. We just do that once. If you did this every time, if you made sure to, if you put these in update, you're going to fuck things up because you're going to keep allocating more and more memory for things. All right. Update. The difference between update and draw, like it says here, is primarily about organizing how do you want to organize your code. There is no functional difference and we could just remove this whole update thing and put everything in draw and it would be fine. It's primarily about how you want to organize stuff. So we just set these input one to update. We might have to make sure that we update a USB video input every single cycle. Otherwise, we don't get a new frame in memory to work with. We want to make sure that we do this MIDI biz stuff if we're using a MIDI controller. Uh, so it updates a buffer of all the MIDI messages that have come in since the last time we cycled through every time. Draw. Here's where a lot of the juice happens. So we make sure we start everything that happens within frame buffer 0 begin and frame buffer 0 dot end gets drawn to an imaginary screen that lives just in memory. Everything that happens in between shader one begin and shader one down end uh, uh, is primarily going to be happening in this is, is shader one uh, dot frag file that we're going to be looking at in a second. Uh, input one dot draw. Input one is a USB input, so we're drawing uh, the USB input here, and then we're setting a couple of uniform values. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. We end, then we have to make sure that we draw this frame buffer to the screen. This is where you would have to, also if you wanted to change the aspect ratio of stuff, the, the pixel aspect ratio, you'd go in here and change that to 640 by 480 or whatever size you want to work with. You're not going to be able to get very much higher than SD resolution. You're not going to get very much higher than this on a Raspberry Pi 3, 3B+, plus, uh, without losing significant enough frame rate that you're just not doing interesting video stuff anymore. And then we've got some stuff where we can spit data out, either draw it onto the screen or spit it out into the console. We've got examples here I'll go over. We have this exit where we need to make sure that we close up our MIDI stuff. There's a bunch of MIDI things. MIDI, you can ignore most of this MIDI stuff. Uh, and then, I mean, you can take a look at it if you're interested in more. We're not going to cover it in the class. Beyond the scope of the class. Uh, and then there's this key press stuff, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But that is all you need to know about the C++ things. And one final thing I will show you before we actually get to the goods is let's open up the vert and the frag shader. Uh, a vert shader looks like this. The only thing that we need to know about what we're going to be doing is that we've declared a variable called varying vec2 called text core varying. And we're getting the information on like where we're at in a frame. And we're going to pass that over to the shader one dot frag, which receives a variable called varying vec2 text chord varying. It's getting this information from the vertex shader. We are only using the vertex shader to get geometrical information about where we're at, what pixel we're affecting at any time. And that's it. And this is what your shader one frag should look like. Precision hype float. It's pretty hype. It's pretty hyphy. Uh, uh, what this means is how much, how many decimal points do we give to our floating point numbers? 
if you want to have more things running fast, you could have precision be pretty lope or medium or whatever. I forget the exact thing. You can look it up on your own. We'll keep it at hype because I like to have a lot of resolution for playing around with feedback stuff and for doing oscillators. We've got a couple of functions here. And these are actual real functions, not just procedures. Um, and then we've got our void main. This is what's going to draw pixels to the screen. We do some fun stuff with these colors. And at the end, what your fragment shader will always need is something called GL frag color. And you have to give it some sort of a vec4, uh, a vector with four values. This is a real vector, not the weird C++ vector, which I will... I'm only mentioning now because uh, I want to make sure if you ever come across a C++ vector data type in the future that you don't confuse it with an actual real vector. This is a real vector. The C++ thing is not. Um, and when we talk about linear algebra vectors, they're, they're, they have nothing to do with the C++ data type. And let's all just pretend they don't exist for the entirety of this course. We want to make sure that it gets uh, uh, something with a uh, 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 VEC4 to spit out, and that is the color for every single pixel on your screen. So <clears throat> that is the most I will talk about the details of coding during this entire class. Uh, 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 make sure to save this sort of the timestamps for this for if any point during the, the the remainder of the videos that you like want to go back and be like wait a minute what the fuck was ofapp.hl about <clears throat> come back to this go and take a look uh, 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 and you'll have this as reference so I apologize if you're watching this linearly this is like literally the most boring thing you can like uh, go over but we've got to get this boring shit out of the way to do anything interesting whatsoever and I want to make sure you have the ability to at least sort of like oh preprocessor directive that's what I need to look up in order to find out more about this I want to make sure you have the tools to like educate yourself more if you need to but you won't need to know anything more than this for the the purposes of this class all right all right, so let's start talking about working with color in the shader. So, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but we can mention this. It'd probably be good to mention this a couple of times. We say shader, uh, GLSL, GLES, OpenGL. These all sort of refer to the same thing in a sense. Uh, 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 for us here, or the, 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 we're going to think about the shader is these text files that we see in here. So we have a fragment shader, and that's always a dot frag, and we have a vertex shader, and that's a dot vert. For our purposes, we're always going to have a vertex shader and a fragment shader, uh, and they'll both be labeled the same thing. And that's just if we want to have one single shader pass per draw. You can definitely do multiple shader passes per draw. We're not going to cover that in this class. Um, so we'll say the shader is this text file. Uh, uh, and that gets loaded into this C++ file and executed. Uh, uh, and then we write the text of the shader in GLES. And that's Graphics Language Embedded System. So this is a specific version of uh, 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 GLSL, which is made for these sort of embedded systems like a Raspberry Pi. Um, something to note is that if you take this same code and try to execute it on a desktop, you're going to get some errors because GLES and GLSL are not the same thing. Uh, 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 I may or may not make a different version of this class that goes into working on the desktop. There are definitely some videos on my YouTube that go into some of the basics, some very similar stuff to this. Uh, mostly focusing on color geometry and feedback on my YouTube channel, working on the desktop. So there's there's always that if you want to play around not on a Raspberry Pi. But this class, if you want to make it plug and play, you've got to work on a Raspberry Pi 3B, 3B+. All right. So working with color. So we have this VEC4. And a VEC4 means a vector, and that just means some sort of a data type that has four components. Each of the components is uh, separated by a little comma. So we declare this vec4 color 
And we need to use this terminology every time you declare a vector, more or less. Uh, vec4 color equals vec4, and then a parentheses, and we describe the components. Um, you can see we're describing the components. There's something called color x, sx, color y, and 1.0. Um, and in order, this represents the red component. Color x is red. sx represents the green component. Color Y represents the blue component, and 1.0 represents the alpha component. Alpha, for our purposes in this class, we will pretend that alpha does not exist. As far as your monitor, as far as a screen goes, as far as the actual like output goes, uh, uh, unless you're working with some sort of multi-leveled uh, 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 mixing like sort of thing, alpha is completely imaginary. There is no such thing as an alpha value for your actual pixels on the monitor or for the actual uh, uh, phosphors on your CRT. Alpha is just used uh, to make certain processing things easier, but it's not really a part, it's not a native part of the color space. It's a processing part of the color space. So we're gonna pretend that alpha is just always 1.0 for our purposes here. Um, a lot of other things, if you if you look at like shader stuff that's written for like, you know, like Adobe products and stuff, they use alpha a lot more because it makes certain operations uh, quicker and easier uh, to, to have this sort of alpha component involved. But we are going to pretend that alpha does not exist and base all of our stuff not on alpha, base our mixing stuff not on alpha whatsoever. So we are only concerned with red, green, and blue. So let's look at what we've got here. Color X equals text chord varying, text chord varying X. Color Y equals text chord varying dot Y. Um, remember that this text chord varying, called a varying vec2, we got this from the vertex shader. Uh, what this refers to is the specific pixel that we're working with at, and at every single point of uh, 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 execution of the shader. So something to note here is we see there's uniform data types uniform sampler 2D, uniform float, and we have a varying data type, varying vec2. So if you look over here, we get our uniform data types. These are sent by the C++. So over here, we set uniform 1FSX and we set uniform 1F nano 1. These are both controls from the keyboard and from the nano controller, respectively. Uh, we don't see anything that says uniform sampler 2d text zero uh, that's because if you just do this draw operation if you take some sort of a, a texture and draw it input one has a texture along with it anytime you do dot draw and give it like some coordinates you're 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 implicitly sending a texture to be uh, 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 to some sort of a buffer we are explicitly sending that texture to this frame buffer here uh, uh, so input one dot draw means over here we have some sort of a data type called text zero which is automatically generated and we'll talk more about how to bind multiple textures to the shader once we get into the feedback section of the class but we have these uniforms and then we have this varying so a uniform data type for a shader uh, 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 you need to understand first how does a shader work so this OFApp.cpp, we see up here that its frame rate is 30 frames per second, meaning that this code, the update and draw, these are cycling and running uh, uh, 30 times per second. So uh, 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 one thirtieth of a second, we start a frame buffer, we start the shader, we do all the shadery things, and then we draw that to the screen. So in the meanwhile, in this section here, once shader one begins, what happens is all the code in shader one here executes simultaneously for every single pixel in your output uh, 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 screen, your output buffer. So everything that's happening in here, it doesn't know anything other than what specific pixel do we care about drawing at this specific time. So this varying vec2 changes per draw session based upon what pixel we're at at any given time. 
whereas these uniform variables stay the same per every single draw session of the CPP. So that's the difference between a uniform variable and a varying uh, uh, variable in a shader, is the uniform, no matter what pixel on the screen you're at, those uniform variables are going to be the same. It doesn't matter if it's this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this, 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 this. it's all going to be the same variable. Whereas the varying vec2, this variable changes for every single vari for every single pixel on the screen because it's a different position. It's a different place we can look up in a buffer. It's a different place we can draw to a buffer. Uh, so yeah, that's the difference between varying and uniform. So we're using this varying information in order to do something different. So color X is based on the X position of the pixel. Color Y is based on the Y position of the pixel. So we're sort of making this gradient here, which uh, 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 is based on X and Y positions of the variable. If I want to instead just look at X, just to show you an example of this. So I'll just say 0. 0, comma, 0, comma, 1.0, and then comment the rest of this out. Make sure to save this, uh, uh, and then I've changed the shader. So uh, 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 because I've changed the shader, we need to recompile this, or we don't need to recompile it. We just need to press make run, and that will execute the shader. One of the most common reasons to get sort of like goofed up in working with shaders is that you edit the shader, you don't save it, and then you make run again, and then you're like, why didn't anything change? And it's because it didn't load up. If you don't save this here, it's not going to automatically like uh, uh, load the new uh, changes into the data. Okay, so we make this run again. So what we should see here is red will go from 0 to 1. Uh, our coordinate system here is normalized from 0 to 1. Uh, and we're going to see black all the way on the left side going to full saturated red on the right side. So, pretty simple. And then I control C to close it out. If we isolate the other part and say zero color Y, and then I'll save and we'll run again. What we're going to see here is that starting from the top of the screen, which is 0 in Y coordinates, going down to 1 in Y coordinates, we're going to see black going down to fully saturated blue going at the bottom. There we go. And if we pull these things all together, put, put back what we had earlier. So originally we had the gradient of color X, making a red gradient going from left to right, this SX variable, which we'll talk about in a second, and color Y going from top to bottom, we would have this sort of interference gradient of black over on the right side going to full saturated red on the left, or getting my left and right mixed up because there's too many mirrors happening here. Full gradient from a 0 to 1 <laughs> red, full gradient of a blue going like this, adding together. Uh, uh, alpha being set at 1 the whole time. And then, oh, what happened there? Using the wrong keyboard. Ha, 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 ha. So anyway, um, let me actually fix this. Make sure to save. And then let's trace back what this SX is. So uniform float SX. We go back to OFF.CP and we see this is set uniform 1F SX. If I control F SX, and then we try to find the next one. So that one, that one, that one, where we could print it out to the screen if we wanted to. And then keep going. Down here in key pressed, if key equals S, then SX we increment by 0.1. If key equals S, then we decrement by 0.1. Uh, so let me just show you if I wanted to edit this and make the increment and decrement a little bit smaller. Press S, Control S, make sure to save it. Uh, so now what we should expect to see 
uh, 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 is that if I press S, it'll make the screen more green all, all everywhere. And if I press X, it'll make it less green. And we're starting out at zero. So let me make sure if we want to compile this because I altered the CPP file, we have to do make and make run. It'll take a little bit longer. Um, one thing to mention, usually what, just what everyone in these classes has asked me when we do this is, why can't I use a Raspberry Pi 4? Uh, and there's actually a lot of reasons why it's kind of a huge pain in the ass to do any of this sort of stuff on a Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, the most prominent one for our purposes is that, uh, uh, just for this class, it takes much, much longer for things to compile on a Raspberry Pi 4, for whatever reason. Meaning that something like this, which took, you know, about 25, 35, 45 seconds to compile, could actually take like several minutes. Uh, 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 and that just is constant. It, it, it's quite intolerable <laughs> from for my, uh, uh, my, my perspective. So if I'm pressing S here and I hold it down, we see that we're sort of increasing the green component everywhere. And at a certain point, because we still have the gradient of blue and red, it's not going to be completely green everywhere because it's still got the red and uh, uh, blue gradients to interact with. But we see up in the, the, the upper left-hand corner where it would be pure black otherwise, we've got pure green happening. And then I press X, X and we see that it pulls the green component out. So at this point, you have the basic amount of information you need in order to do the homework. The homework is listed uh, in the, the text portion of this video. Uh, I'll just sort of talk you through the first problem here too, just to kind of show you how we'll go about these things. Uh, but now you know about red, green, and blue. The, the, the components of the color space that we're going to be working on. And you understand that text chord varying dot X is a, uh, uh, represents what pixel we're at on the screen, normalized from zero to one. Uh, uh, text chord varying dot Y represents the Y component of what pixel we're at on the screen, going from zero to one. And these things start up in the upper left hand side of the screen and go upwards to the right and downwards. So pretty basic stuff, not the most intuitive thing in the world, but the whole purpose of this homework is to sort of make you understand, uh, to give you some intuition for what otherwise might be an unintuitive sort of thing. RGB color space, unless you've worked in it extensively, is a pretty unintuitive space to move around in. And we're only gonna be doing a little bit of RGB this time around, and the homework will be sort of showing you how to move into HSB from RGB and use that as a more intuitive color space. But I want you to make, wanna make sure that everyone understands RGB, you're gonna, all the pixel information you're going to get, manipulate and spit out at a certain point, uh, at the start and at the end, you're always going to have to be in RGB. And there are certain operations like mixing that you always want to do in RGB if you have the ability to. Otherwise, learning why RGB is kind of wonky and unintuitive is a good reason to just be like, okay, we're going to work in HSB space for the rest of this class. Uh, so yeah, let me show you a little bit of what I mean by the first homework assignment. So set up MIDI or keyboard controls to change intensity of a matte color in the shader by individually controlling R, G, and B. So we're going to sort of avoid using the, 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 the text chord varying stuff for a second and just talk about matte colors first. And we'll use OF, draw bitmap string, or the C out functions to print the numerical values of RGB to the screen so you can start getting a handle on how these values interact. So just to quickly show you what I sort of mean by that is, so let's first, let's just use this SX value and I'll show you how we do grayscale stuff uh, 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 in uh, uh, RGB space. So we can see that we're sending this uniform value SX to the shader. If I look down here, we can, this is here, and this should be drawing the SX value to the screen. Um, if we want to, let's spit this out to the console, just to show you how this works. So C out SX. So if you want to change the text stuff in here, you change what's in these quote marks. If you want to change the variable that's being spit out, you change what's in here. 
uh, but since we have this already set up, uh, uh, we can just use this. And then if I want to change the grayscale value of an output mat in here, what I'm going to do is we'll change vec4 equals, we'll change this line. I'm just going to copy it over. And then we'll just make all of the R, G, and B components SX. So a handy rule of thumb is that when you're working in RGB, but you don't want to, you want to have zero saturation and just grayscale manipulation, then you just set the R, G, and B values to be the same value. So there's an RGB color space, it is a cube, and the vertical line that goes from one corner of the cube where everything's zero to the other corner of the cube where everything's one, that is pure black and white. Every other value in the RGB space has some saturation to it. Uh, just this one line in the center, which is sort of the diagonal of the cube, is black and white. So if I just press save, we'll have to do make and make run again in order to get this to recompile what we changed in the CPP and the dot frag. Uh, and I should be able to press S uh, to make it a brighter white. And then once it gets really bright white, I can press X and bring it back down to a dark gray. And that will pretty much show you the last thing that you, and it will also spit out the value of SX to the console, AKA this terminal here that I'm using. So we'll be able to monitor the values that I'm sending in uh, so we can sort of get a feeling for like what actually, what values of things actually make a difference in here. Uh, 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 and that'll give you the, the, the last tiny bit of information that it will be helpful for you to do the homework. Okay, so you can see I'm pressing S. And as we start to go up, we're at 23, 25 right now. So we're at like 25% brightness. We go up to 0.5 and we're at like a pretty comfortable like off white. And then we get higher and then we're at pure white. And if I keep going up, so I'm at like 1.2. It's as if you get over one, that's as white as you can get. And for all of these R, G, and B values, much like the geometric values, uh, 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 these values are normalized from zero to one. So the brightest you can get is, the darkest you can get is zero, and that's zero, 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 and that's black. The brightest you can get is white, that's one, 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 that's R, G, and B equals one, and one, and one, and then all of the colors, all of the other spectrum in between is going to be all values between zero and one. If you send it values above one, you uh, it'll just sort of clamp them off and ignore everything that's over one. And if we go below zero, it, it can't get any blacker than black. So even though I can send a negative value in, the shader is like, I don't care. You can give me negative values. I'm just going to stick it at zero and I'm going to stay right there. So yeah, that is it for the first class. Uh, I hope you have some fun with the homework. It, uh, 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 I have definitely seen some pretty, pretty crazy stuff that people have put together based off of this. Uh, remember, look up things on Shader Toy, look up things on Stack Exchange, look up things on uh, uh, the Book of Shaders. They will all help you a lot, especially when you get to the shapes portion of this. Uh, but yeah. Have fun. Make sure to try. Make sure to try everything in the homework first. And if you can get one quarter of the homework stuff done decently enough, then I would say move on to the next class. You're in a good spot to move on to the next class. All right. Have fun.